Welcome to the Daft Souls podcast, which this week has once again been attacked by ghosts this week in the robotic variety. So this is just a simple disclaimer. This week's episode has been put online for those of you who can put up with the terrible sound quality because they really want to listen to it. However, I will admit that many of you will listen to it and go, oh God, no, this is terrible. Ah, in which case I can only apologise and hope that you do tune in again next week. Thank you very much for your patience. And again, please don't take the mick out of ghosts. Hello and welcome to the Daft Souls podcast. My name is Matt Lees and I am joined once again by Mr. Joe Scrabbles. Hello. And Quentin Smith. Hello. How are you chaps doing today? Not too bad. I'm doing very well. You've got some fetching trousers today. They're bright orange. uh, Because I heard that like red is sort of middle class and looked down upon, but I figured bright orange is is okay. It's like 90s rave is back. Yeah. It's true. There you go. The 90s rave never died, but it did. Onwards. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about what I've been playing because I've been playing it five minutes ago and it's still fresh in my mind. I've been playing um, FTL Advanced Edition, sure, and we did talk about this in the Ghost Cast, um, the, the podcast formerly known as Episode 2, but I've actually had some more time to play with it now. And as I was chatting to you yesterday, Quentin, it's still like amazingly frustrating because of the fact that you, you plan through the game and then you get to the end boss and then the end boss feels like a a different bollocks mini game that just kicks you in the balls. <laughs> I know it's a variety of, of just ball pummeling that game. The thing that made me over the last three days since the advanced edition came out, I've rage uninstalled it twice. Oh my <laughs> god! Oh, it's a small game. Yeah, and I because I've downloaded it again twice. But no, one of the really frustrating things was um, one of the random events that comes up, and uh, it is just. Hey, there's something's been sighted on a planet. Do you want to send a crewman down? And yeah. send a crewman down and just I don't know what the odds are, but sometimes you lose a crewman, sometimes you gain a crewman, and that's such a huge swing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I rage raged on Twitter and uh, just yelled that it, it I find that frustrating too because it's like I'm aware that basically for those of you who don't know, it's kind of like a kind of Star Trek simulator where um, the, uh, when it's at its strongest is when you're doing the actual ship combat because that's like the, the mechanics and the systems that kind of generally speaking work quite well but in between you get these the nice colourful bits that I love of being like oh this has happened what do you want to do and you get multiple choices however usually the choices are as simple as intervene or I'm not touching that bye <laughs> but the problem is it doesn't never gives you any sense like some of them are like some of them are really bad, the outcomes of it goes badly. And it never really gives you any sense of how bad it's going to be. But I know that if you have specific criteria, like if you have a specific type of weapon or a specific type of crew member, you get a third option that's like, ah, you can use this special advantage that you've currently got. So I kind of know that there's always an easy way to do it. But the problem is that you kind of, I don't know what the probabilities are before then, because some of them feel like you just go, oh, I'll give it a go. And it's like, your crew member is dead. You know? <laughs> really? It's uh, it just like feels like that escalated quickly. It's unforgivable, really. It's it's not a decision. It's not a decision you're making. It's all smoke and mirrors. It says, oh, do you want to do this or this? And you don't know the odds. You don't know whether you're going to be rewarded or punished for it. And the fact that in multiple playthroughs, if you even try and learn what the correct option is, the game goes, oh, it's different this time. Sorry, you've yeah. lost your pilot. <laughs> It's appalling. It's rolling invisible dice, isn't it? It's, yeah, it is. And it's no, there's no often decision making in that process. And the, my least favorite thing, even about the ship combat, is that it is often good. And sometimes, if you are not specced for a particular fight, which obviously you had no chance of deciding, like what you're going to attack, it can just ruin you. The systems are really, really clumsy. At well, level. and that's how uh, one of the things I'm really happy about with uh, I've actually been playing the advanced edition. I like the advanced edition, but what I like more is the captain's edition. Which is a massive mod. I say massive, it's 50 meg, because you know, <laughs> uh, it's that sort of game. But it really overhauls a ton of stuff and it works with Advanced Edition. Because I love all new stuff with Advanced Edition, but it does need more tweaking. But I'm really impressed with it. Just because it adds like tons of new stuff on the kind of combat side and like new weapons and new things you can do. But also just implements like loads of new things to the rest of the game. Like, even the simple thing of actually now it gives you the opportunity to surrender at the start of the battle. So if you're like, if you fly into a sector and there's some pirates or some baddies, as long as they're not the um, the rebels, and because obviously the rebels are like the, the bad men, 
Well, maybe you're the bad man. Exactly. I like, I like the I like the fact in FTL you're never really sure if you are a good guy or a bad guy. You just don't question it. You're, like, you're the ship going back to get the Death Star. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to let me through. I need to go make a phone call. Hello, is that the Death Star? <laughs> yeah. Fire. <laughs> get them all. Um, but it's nice that if you do end up flying into a sector and there's pirates or whatever and it's like, I don't want to fight, then you can just... You can then surrender, and you can choose what offer to give them. You can be like a weak offer, a good offer, or a really good offer. That is a perfect example of the kind of actual interesting choice that FTL yes. almost never, ever gives you. And it's funny, because they've clearly added loads more writing um, to the game as well, because there's so many more scenarios and stuff already. And I only I've literally, and for those of you who've played FTL, you have an idea of, of what this means. I've only really played it for about an hour, and I've already seen loads of stuff that That's I haven't cool. seen. And it's like... I, you know, usually an hour in FTL is nothing. It, it just mm. freezes past. But even stuff like um, simple things out of like now when you you're about to destroy a slaver ship, it's made me rethink so much about how I used to play the game. And the fact it's like when you when you're about to destroy a slaver ship, the slavers will always go, "No, don't destroy me." Why don't you have one of these delicious slaves? <laughs> I swear that was in the basic edition. No, it was. It was. It was yeah. Uh, but what I'm saying is that. But the way they do it is they go, have one of my slaves. They're all going to die anyway. And so you just go, yes, free crew member. And it was always a good deal because you're like, I get a free crew member. I get a slave. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> but that's the thing. And that's why what I love in Captain's Edition is you have the option to either say, like, yes, all right, we'll take the slave and we'll drop him off at the next planet. Or, yeah, we'll have a slave. But then it has these moments where basically, I don't know if there are any long-term effects of it, but it has this moment where it basically pops up and it's like, uh, you are basically now engaging in slavery. Like, <laughs> um, that's kind of against all sorts of Space Geneva conventions. I really like the idea that there's the mod is just morals. Like all it does is puts in what like okay dialogue boxes that says, by the way, you're being a gross asshole. Like that's the worst that's thing. Your that, decision the worst here. thing I've seen happen so far is crew vetoing. Your um your decisions. That's fantastic! Oh my god! This yeah. Sounds... So if you do stuff that's bad, then your crew it will kind of it will say, "Do you want to proceed with this?" And you'll do it. And then I've had times. I don't know if it can lead to worse than that. Maybe you can lose the game if you keep doing it and your crew keep going. But all I've seen is a crew just basically going, "No, we're not doing this," and it's like basically says in text like, "Oh, this is mutiny," but there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, and but then you can do all sorts of evil stuff as well. Like you can now do it so when ships surrender. And this is another thing that, that your crew can basically be like, ah, no. Um, you can basically be like, I surrender, I surrender, please, take all of my things. And you go, brilliant, brilliant, destroy them. It's <laughs> 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 just, just like, oh man, I had so much fun with that. I was just like, I, it, it brought out my evil streak in a dangerous way. Well, just it's like, funny, because when you're in the slug sectors and they do all the things of like, they ping you, oh, we need help, and you fly towards them and you click the button that says save them, and then of course they teleport a bomb onto your ship or something. If that's the kind of organic system I would love to do myself yes. or try and yeah. do. I mean, so much of FTL is just those set pieces and then it all ties back to that very simple ship combat. So yeah, a bit of flexibility sounds perfect. It's really, really nice. I mean, even some of the scenarios I've encountered because of the fact that it's no longer when you're going through sectors, it's, not longer, it's no longer like, this is where the slugs live. This is where the robot men live. They have really specific things. So it'd be like, at one point, I didn't go there, but it's like, Oh, the mantis armada something. I'm just like, no. <laughs> I'm not going to fly through a mantis armada. But then if you're feeling badass, you're like, I'm going to fly through a mantis armada. But there was one sector I went through, they've added loads more environmental stuff, like there's nanobots that eat away at your ship. Um, there's acid clouds that burn away at your hull. Um, and that's nasty, because it's just this thing of like, I decided, you get loads of scrap for going through them though, because you always find like, like loads of dead and dying ships and things. <laughs> and so it's this thing of being like watching your ship gradually degrade as you like keep going into the acid clouds, being like, I should probably leave. <laughs> People have so much sweet treasure here. Um, and even stuff like just there are space stations now. Like they've had, yeah, I heard, which yeah. can't evade but, but are enormous weapon platforms. Yeah, and often unmanned. And there are like space stations that offer you things like, hey, you can repair here and you can choose to be like, you can choose to like basically destroy them and <laughs> if you want. Like, so it gives you the opportunity to be like a complete bastard in a way which just 
was only really facilitated by the normal vanilla FTL, by the ability to like switch off the oxygen and set people on fire. Yeah, it's so mercenary, the, the base game of FTL. You will do whatever it takes to survive. I mean, the sniping is a great example because you're, you're looking at that game in terms of numbers. There is yeah. no morals to it. What, give what? me a 1% higher chance. Oh, okay, I'll do that. Well, that's the thing. The entire thing is, is just you're looking at cross-sections the whole time, and that's how you play that game, is in cross-section. It's like, what... What will facilitate my yeah, design you're really for a, getting you're through? You're a captain or a middle manager. Yeah, you're like an architect of evil. Right. It's kind of fun. Speaking of which, Prison Architect, uh, which I haven't actually played it, but um, I was living a, a last year my housemate who lived with it. That was an incredibly fun, horrific exercise. Have either of you managed to play uh, Prison Architect? I saw them do a talk at uh, Eurogamer, I think, mm. but, uh, and it sounded really interesting, but it's just not something I've ever... I think it's more to that every time I've seen them talking about that game, they've always said, oh, I haven't played it yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is like, I kind of have tried to take, take the word on it. I'm so happy for those guys, though, because it wasn't the same people who made, um, is it Introversion? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> and, I mean, that's just, that, that, that could have so easily been a horrible sob story. <laughs> <laughs> because for years they were just making really, really cool games and just not making any money at all. And it broke my heart because I was just throwing every, all the money I could at everything they released. But it's like... I was like, no, don't. And then they've really hit it big with Prisoner. Well, I hope so. I mean, it's, well, I mean, it seems to be like really popular. For a long time, it was like top of the Steam uh, charts. Mm. I, well, I certainly hope they've got the money they need. I mean, it's always difficult with things like Kickstarter, you know, because if you yeah. get so much of your money up front, I mean, that going. it may not be that they've made like mega, mega money, but they've definitely been making some money. Which and is, the game is being developed, than, which is yeah. awesome. And uh, no, it was. It's funny because, yeah, I haven't played uh, So You're Being Hunted for the same reason of I'm going to wait until it's ready, yeah. which really means I'm waiting for uh, the lead of um, Jim Ross Neal to officially declare it's hit 1.0, which is an entire arbitrary number if you're adding something new every week. Oh, but, email him. Yeah. Oh, well, he's just said. Oh, right, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he just said on Twitter, it's, it's coming now. I was going to say, yeah. So I'm yeah. excited. But uh, no, it's it was beautiful seeing Brendan play this early edition of Prison Architect all the same, but like... Are just the most marvelous bugs because the game is so surreal and really bleak and Kafka esque anyway. That like he builds a visitor room, and for the, after you know how many in game weeks he finally had a prisoner with a visitor. So the prisoner walks into the room and the visitor walks into the room and they both leave and he looks away to build a new cell and goes back. And there's some kind of dirt related bug because the room is just filthy. <laughs> like it looks like a hundred people have been living in there for a week. It's just <laughs> disgusting. He has to send cleaning crews in there after cleaning crews, after cleaning crews, scrubbing every inch of this room in this kind of, what did they do in there? <laughs> situation. Well, they are, they are entitled to 10 minutes alone. So. They are. <laughs> It's amazing, amazing what you can do in seven minutes. Sure, but I mean, if a sci-fi game is weird, that you know, it's it's fine. If a if something like so you're being hunted is buggy, that's surreal. But when Prison Architect, a game that is really trying to model reality, it's like Deadly Premonition. You know, the closer a game tries to be serious, those bugs just tend to be even yeah. more beautiful. It's the funny thing about because um, there are bugs in Captain's Mode or FTL. There are things where sometimes just things don't quite work as they should. But there's one that really I love because it's like an honesty system. Because basically they've added a new system so you can, uh, t it takes up your augment slots for your ship, but you can, if you leave some of them free, you can buy cargo at trading count places. Yeah, I heard, you can and sell cargo it. and sell it. But then when you sell it, because they, there's no way for them to mod it so they can remove things from your ship, it means that you sell it and then you get the money and then you have to like delete it. You have to ship. basically then, then manually go and sell it in the shop. So, and if you don't, then you can just abuse the system to keep selling it again and again. But it's like basically it means it's like it's like oh you sold it, and there comes a little message being like oh you know sell it now. <laughs> <laughs> it, but it sort of requires you in that in the way that like you know traditional kind of board of card games requires you to have that degree of honesty. Yeah, it's like I always find it really funny whenever I've, I've tried to introduce people to like who haven't played board games since they were kids, one of the questions that I often have a certain type of person asking me quite quickly is, but what happens if we cheat? And it's like, well, you don't get invited around again. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no systems we can put in play to stop you from cheating. Just don't. It's funny. <laughs> I've, I've felt that gravity as well when I'm really into a board game and, you know, I'm holding a hand of cards or something. An op opportunity comes up to cheat where I would be able to. And I tell you what, you can feel it tugging you. You have to sort of close off that part in your brain and go, no, 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 no it's not a monkey but, brain. But you feel it, the lizard part of you goes, cheat. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what though, uh, Earthbound, the original uh, SNES RPG, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, aka Mother 2, yeah, yeah. Um, 
which if you haven't played it is just a fascinating postmodern JRPG. Postmodern, despite the fact that it came out in like ninety five. I know, right? I, I, I yeah. can't get over how modern like and no, it's it's absurd and it's a, it parodies <laughs> games and art JRPG so much, but it's it's modern and you are well, going from town to town in some weird America, but not America. Type There's thing. some dark stuff in that game. As yeah, well. and aliens and punks with robots. Punks with those robots are my being attacked by oak trees. <laughs> uh, the first enemy you fight in the game is a spiteful crow, <laughs> like who's wearing sunglasses <laughs> for some reason. But the thing I remember in that is you get to one town in it, and it is actually really um, heartwarming. And the ending is the best ending of any JRPG. I still never finished it. You don't right. really need to, but if, but you should look up the ending if if you haven't. And this goes as well to people at home because we were talking about how JRPGs have such terrible. Endings, but look up the ending of Earthbound because it's so, it's so clever and brilliant and tear jerking. But there is one village in Earthbound, bringing it back to the idea of honesty, where you find a. It's a rural town, and you find a basket, and you look at it. It's full of eggs, and you need food because that's like potions in Final Fantasy. Mm. And it says uh, you can take an egg, and the little sign says it's an honesty system. Leave five dollars if you if you take a dozen eggs, and and the, and the game says do you want to leave five dollars? And there's no repercussions for that in the game, but just as like a hero, quote unquote, you and your party, like we could just take all the fucking eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but That's no, you, whether you, or not you want to, you pay. I, actually, I, I, it's almost better as well if nothing happens because yeah. it's like often in games now we've been conditioned to know that whenever you'll we'll be punished for it. Yeah, like karma exists. Like you will always in games you will always be punished for doing something good, and you will always be you know you always probably get some sort of comeuppance, even if it's just another bloke who wants to fight you because you've done something bad and I like I mean it was kind of gutting because I got killed really quickly afterwards in the FTL but I went through a section on Captain's Mode which was a plague sector oh really and it was this thing oh, I've got to play this and it was this thing of basically being like everywhere I was going people being like you can't come through here it's plague sector and I'm like no I'm going to do it I'm going to come through I'm like the whole time thinking why did I choose to come through a plague sector this seems like a bad idea and then and being just like rubber necking it's just like it's like watching a car accident like yeah, these like, guys are going to some crazy boils yeah, well, it's kind of like it's like you see this there's these ships basically teleporting um, healing bombs down onto a planet so they're basically like not allowing anyone to leave the planet but they're just trying to keep them healed but then like someone just teleports onto your ship and they're clearly from the surface and they're just like help you've got to get me out of here and you're like oh god and then it ends up being like people stopping you and they want to check your crew and one of your crew they think oh he's got the plague and you're like no and you end up fighting them wow and then you end up like having people being like yeah you can join my crew and it's like even says like oh they, they seem alright <laughs> but being like what the fuck like, are all of my crew going to die because I've been letting plague people on? But then there was another guy who was just like, he was stuck on a space station. He was like, oh, can I join your crew? Like, no, I'm, I'm abandoned here. And he joins your crew and it just says, like, afterwards, it's just like, you hope this is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that episode of Firefly. That's I know it. where that's going. She's going to take her top off <laughs> and it's going to be Christine Hendrick. And there'll be basically, at the end of the day, not really many negative. It's fine. <laughs> um... My favourite. Oh, sorry, no, 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 you were going to say something. I was going to say something. Really I was, I was, I was, well. I was, I was ready to bring movement. in. I was ready to bring in a whole new game to this conversation sure. that sort of helps around this conversation. Have either of you played Out There, which uh, is an iOS? Uh, yes, yes, I have. Is it idea. similar so, to the Out There Out Here Brothers? No, it's not. Okay, but if it was, it would be funnier. <laughs> um, it's essentially well, it's sort of like. Terry Gilliam's FTL. It's like <laughs> it's, a very good it's really strange. So it's um I think it's a single French guy or maybe a couple of French dudes and they've it's you're in a you're in a ship travelling from one end of like this mad galaxy trying to get back to Earth and it's just fucking miles away and you never make it because it's impossible. But the reason it's got the the reason I thought of it is because you were talking about the sort of bleakness of prison architects, but it's got FTL's basic structure, which you jump yeah. from system to system with random events, but it's entirely about the random events. And you sort of start, or I started to forgive it for how completely arbitrary those events were, because that's the whole message yeah. of the game, is that space is just awful <laughs> and full of weird shit and aliens that hate you and won't give you the resources don't you need. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I like it. Just like, kill yourself. I, it's like, right. I didn't enjoy it that much, but what I did like is that the game says, you know, uh, you go down to a planet trying to drill fuel and then it says, um, ah, your fuel drill's broken. Yeah. Do you want to repair it? It'll cost you iron and then you need, but I need iron. What if my engine breaks? Because then I'm properly fucked. That's the thing. And the, but you're very much aware in a way that FTL does not tell you that the game is just gambling. Like yeah. out there is just, 
You're hedging your bets. You're trying to put your resources when you want. You're praying mostly. Whereas FTL has this underlying thing of it's a system. You can own it. You well, that's the thing. It's all it, FTL feels like it's giving you power and then taking it away without asking. Yeah. Whereas out there is just like you're fucked. It's that space. It's totally thing. amoral. I don't know how long it will last, but the nice thing for me about Capitalism on FTL is it's forced me to get out of that habit of just pressing the keyboard buttons without really reading stuff. Yeah. Because there's so many new things happening and so many. They changed the system so much in terms of the dialogue that now I found myself just being like dum 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 pressing buttons and accidentally doing all sorts of crazy shit. Like, oh, God. <laughs> Whereas the problem is, yeah, you, your sugar you get, has a naked man on it looking at you expectantly. <laughs> what you just sort of go like, oh, there's, there's a weird weird horses on a planet. Yeah, fine. Uh, and it's just like but the problem is you get <laughs> horses. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's that, of, that happens a lot. That's well, a lot. Well, I always imagine them to be like mustaches from the pinata. Because <laughs> they describe them as being multicolored horse like creatures. And I'm like, I just imagine these like this massive herd of mustachios. Yeah, let's bring one of them fucking pinatas. What happens if you bring it on board? I've always thought it was a terrible idea. Oh, it's not that it bad. It's someone. another random generator that can be really bad, can be alright. Yeah. But the problem is, it means uh, you're completely right, though, being like, you end up just being like, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. And it's only because you've lost a crew member. You're like, what? <laughs> but it's like, it, it should at least do a second level thing. So it's like, if it looks like it's going to get bad, then you have a second chance to be like, get out of there. Or like, you know, that might still result in you dying, but have a less bad chance of you dying. It's you know? funny how a few games have kind of, uh, or roguelikes, have quite been able to master the sense of randomness of something like Hangband or like the really early roguelikes where, you know, you can be proceeding through a dungeon, you'll be aware that your resource and your luck and your health are slipping away and you'll come across a, a temple or something that's, you know, engraved with dark markings and it's a temple to an evil fucking god and the game says, do you want to pray here? And it's that, and that's, that's, a beautiful moment of decision making of just like how far can I make up myself? This is gonna be, you know bite me in the ass. There's no way this goes well. Probably, and then you pray and maybe you die, but that's okay because the game gave you all the information you needed to make that really stupid gamble because maybe it would work out. Yeah. I guess Dungeons of Dreadmore is. I haven't played it that much, but I yeah, guess Dungeons of Dreadmore is basically the same. But you can do stuff that is clearly like oh, this is a good idea. Probably not. <laughs> but you can like a, a lot of things in that aren't a good idea. It, it does sort of say. Just inverse yeah, roulette. Sure. It's like there's one empty chamber. You might get it. See how it goes. <laughs> it's like this stuff with mysterious green liquid. It's like, yeah, don't drink that. <laughs> <laughs> like, unless you know what something is, don't drink it. Like the, if you've got a magical spell and you don't know what it is, maybe don't cast it. So you end up casting it like at the point at which like you're desperate. And it's yeah. really nice. So like I've had things where before I've I've kept things. I've kept like a one that has like a magical displacement in Dungeons of Dreadmore. And then when you're about to die, you cast it and like through some miracle you end up on the outside of the map and it's fine. But it's so dangerous because it can displace you anywhere, which means it can so easily displace you into a wall. <laughs> <laughs> and just be like, you're dead. You're dead. A great an example of what FCL could do to give you more control over those systems is the classic Star Trek thing of I need more power. It might not the ship captain. I don't care. I need more power. And just a very simple way to push any system on the ship which might destroy you utterly. Yeah, like, well, they've actually kind of done that in a nice way of being like, when you get to a sector with nothing in it, you can choose through a variety of things if you've got the right equipment on your ship. So you can be like, let's try and make some fuel from like old fuel shells, or let's build some, you can spend some, um, some like scrap to make like loads of missiles. But then it's when you do that, there's a chance that it might accelerate the fleet because they're like, you're basically hanging about mm. doing something. Mm. But it means rather than desperately scouring the internet for fuel, you can be like, we need more fuel, Captain. Like, okay, <laughs> stop here. Let's make some fuel. And It's pretty smart. But um, something else I was going to talk about last week, and a few people listening to the podcast got really frustrated because I, I name-dropped it and then just stopped. Uh, but I've been playing loads of Monster Hunter, and I know both of you have played... Well, I know you have, because obviously in the Ghost podcast, we... Uh, well, we, we all talked about we Monster all got for a long time in Ghostcast. Yeah. And then... That vicious, that Mary just didn't. Mary hates. I, I think Mary had trouble with the Brachidios once, and uh, <laughs> yeah, no, Mary didn't enjoy really that. Upset about that. Uh, she stormed out. I haven't seen her since. But um, it was that. It was that sort of uh, exorcism ganache that we ate. That was <laughs> that was really that really worked for us. Really hit the spot. Anyway, we're ignoring Monster Hunter again. Oh my god! Can you imagine? So we just killed someone. They would have had an embolism or something. <laughs> what should we talk about about Monster Hunter? Well, it's good, isn't it? It's fucking it rules. But it, it's really like 
It takes a long time to do anything. Yeah, if people uh, aren't aware and go out and don't know much about Monster Hunter and, and hear the three of us say it's great and go off and buy it, you're going to be disappointed for the first hour unless you know what you're getting into, which is a colossally You're going to be disappointed for like the first eight yeah, hours. It's, it's a, In fact, you're going to be disappointed permanently unless you also have a friend who's playing it. Mm. Well, I don't know, you see. Well, see, now, now, because I feel like we've become, like, mirror images, because I've been trying to play Dark Souls 2, like you were saying about being like, it's not meant to prevent your own, someone loads people to the boss and stuff, and I've been doing that, and it's been way too easy. Mm. Like, and actually, like, I kind of got slagged off when I made my little Dark Souls diary, everyone's going, you can't say the game's easy, and then be, like, double summoning on all the bosses, and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's a fair point. But actually, I was trying to make a point of the fact that the main game, like, not the bosses, just the bits in between aren't that difficult. Well, at the risk of getting further off topic of Monster, if you imagine if we fasten like a no, rubber belt... About about <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's not going to be a running joke. Let's lash ourselves to Monster Hunter and walk yes. in the direction of Dark Souls 2, not forgetting Monster Hunter, and I will say that, now I've finished it, no spoilers, but what they've done is put a lot of effort into New Game Plus, and insanely, I've heard that it's actually darker, as in the gamma is lower, as in you need to use torches more in New Game Plus. There are also, also, the first thing you encounter in New Game Plus is a new enemy type that isn't in the base game. It's like an entirely new enemy type, which you do not see. It, like it's What Dark Souls 2 has done, and I realise this now, is it has traded the uh, Zach Gage, uh, shout out to you because I'm stealing your line, um, it traded the holistic di design of Dark Souls 1 where everything is connected and you have a really good experience in your first run through for a game that is a lot smoother, you're going to find it easier to drift through the game, you're going to have less uh, really difficult pinch points, in fact, the one area I had, I had a difficulty with, which is just after Castle Dragon Lake, has now been patched to be slightly easier. Uh, and now New Game Plus is the harder experience that people are looking for. So yeah, a much smoother game, which is not necessarily better, but or worse, but it's not what people are looking for, necessarily. <coughs> But I've been playing Monsanto on my own because A, I don't have many friends, and B, I've got it on 3DS, I haven't got a Wii U, and as you can see, you gentlemen can actually see my desk at the moment. It's fairly full capacity at the moment with things. I don't really have room for another console in there, I can't squeeze one in. Um, so I'm happy on the 3DS. I've kind of developed a, a way of playing on the 3DS without making my hands hurt and clawing up into the monsters, um, which is a, a skill, I think. But I've been really happy playing it on my own, and I've hit some points where I've really struggled because I haven't had weapons that are good enough. What's the biggest thing you've killed so far? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I say biggest, my dear. Um, His uh, name was Ben. <laughs> I met him in a pub. <laughs> so my answer is went down like a big sack of bricks. <laughs> what are you wearing on your hat? So oh, difficult question. Now I've been, I actually am in the process of building some, making some new stuff. But at the moment, I think I've got a. Uh, it's like a baggy. I think I've got baggy. Baggy trousers. Keep talking. You've got no. You've got a baggy. Hat. Baggy trousers. It's um, cool. Those, those have got the goggles. No, no. I'm thinking of roggies. <laughs> Jesus Christ. There's so many geese. I've been killing know. roggies. I think roggies are the ice ones, right? Roggy. Yes. Or the poison. No, no. baggies. Baggies are the ice ones. Roggies are the poison. Oh, ones. I've been doing roggies then. Anyway, <laughs> what's the best thing you've killed? <laughs> uh, I, uh, the biggest thing I've killed is probably that big underwater thing. Maggie Harris. No, I haven't killed him yet. I've, okay, just, right. I've just got the quest to kill him. Okay, so mm. what you're approaching right now is the is the pinch point whereby Monster Hunter is going to start expecting you to play both modes at once. The thing about it is you're going to get materials from single player, you're going to get materials from multiplayer. What, are they? you can't get them in single no, player? No, you can, but you're going to have to do the same missions over and over well, again. Well, that's the thing I've been finding player. is it's like I've, I've been kind of basically having to do missions over and over again and I got to a really annoying point where I had tons of skin I've been like skinning in so many monsters it was ridiculous I was just a murderous beast we'd be skinning and then it being like yeah you need um, you need three killer beetles and I'm like I haven't got any of them and then realised like, the only way to get them was just to keep going into an area and it's just like there's something a bit demeaning about that it's like I'm supposed to be a monster hunter and I've just spent two hours Going around through bushes trying to find bloody leggy birds. Yeah, yeah. But you are a hunter. That's what I. That's I what's so nice about monster hunter is it, it does expect you to go through the rigmarole of preparing and just being like savvy enough and dedicated enough. It's like it's no, true. fuck you if you just want to fight the beast. <laughs> you have to like sharpen your sword and get I'm all the right. I love all that. Stuff. That's great. I love all that stuff, and I felt like I really stepped up a, a notch in the game when I got my full 
rocky armor or whatever, which basically meant that I'd gone from having one stat, like one ability, oh, one skill, to yeah. having like six skills all of a sudden and being like really good at sharpening shit and really good at like also. And I'm like, ah, I'm killing things left, right, and center, mainly center. <laughs> <laughs> killing stuff to the left and right does happen if you've got one of those big swords and you're just swinging it accidentally and you I go for the, uh, that. the swim blades. Oh god, really? I but it was funny because I, I found myself just just typing, "Where do I get this?" Yeah, that happens oh, yeah, yeah. a lot. And mm. I found it amusing that it's like I wasn't alone with my killer eater problem, and the fact that somebody had tried to start a petition to make it so that you could produce killer beetles in the farm. And may I say, I agree. It's not fair that I should spend. I don't know. It's one of those games. I'm enjoying it, but it's one of those games where I find myself. I found myself up till half one in the morning, and it was like. I don't know. I mean, sometimes I do that a lot with games, and I was like, I was up till like half one, two in the morning last night. Oh, what were you doing? I was playing this game, and at least I have something to say for it. Like, oh, I killed this fucking dragon. Yeah, it was amazing. I was looking for the dark. Yes, yeah, like, I was looking. <laughs> I like literally. I was like, I was just there, uh, repeatedly playing this mission to collect beetles. Okay, so yes, 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 that does happen rarely, but the thing you're going to be encountering more and more in future is essentially. But you go. It's designed such that you go to a friend's house. You play through some multiplayer missions. You don't obviously need a Wii U. You have a couple of 3DSs. You can play the multiplayer. I think. Yes. Uh, yeah. You have to be local. Yes, you do have to be local. So you do have to. But you wouldn't want anything else. You'd want to be sat in the same room, going, "Oh my God, look out for the thing!" and screaming and shouting. That's when Monster Hunter comes alive. But then you're going to go to your friend's house. You'll play for like four hours. You'll come back home and you'll go, "Oh, I'll play some single player now." But all the items your character got in multiplayer is catapulted up the single player. So you play single player for a bit, and then you go into multiplayer, and all the items you in single player catapult you up the multiplayer, and then you have to play it in tandem. You can't ignore either part of it, unless otherwise you're just going to do so much grinding if you just play multiplayer or just play single player. Yeah, I think that's the thing, is it's basically got to the point where it's just like, oh, I've got to get one of them. You've got to get a friend. I've got to get <laughs> another, really need. another tale of a royal Ludroth. And those yeah. guys are fucking assholes. They, they really like to move mean. about. They do. With those guys. They do. I just like, I just yeah. look at them and, and sort of, they do that thing where they like splash and spit and you just sort of think, like, oh, I feel like I'm like a toddler, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to wait till you calm you down. Do, you grow <laughs> to hate some animals in that game. Like, And it's funny, what, what I, I liked is you do fight the monsters long enough that you develop, and not to sound really wanky, but you develop that sort of hunter's oneness with a thing, <laughs> whereby I, by the end of it, I killed so many Rathians and Rathalos and uh, Pink Rathians and all the other variants that I could not fight them with my eyes closed, but I could totally go on autopilot. Like, and I think that's why a lot of people over the years have been like, you have to play, you have to play, you have to play. And I think it's for the same reason that they know that I love Fantasy Star Online, which is the same thing of being like ridiculously repetitive and strangely obtuse, but then actually there's like a real comfort in that. So mm -hmm. you kind of break through the barrier of repetition and it's like just having a, a constant pipe of sausage and mash. Well, weren't you, you telling me that there's an actual psychological thing where if you expose a human to something for long enough, they'd start liking it? Like Stockholm yeah. Syndrome, but for activity. I think, it, I, think that, I think the... I might be wrong, but I think it's called mere exposure, which doesn't sound like the name of a kind of... A, <laughs> it sounds like, oh, yeah, it's just mere exposure, but <laughs> I, I think it is actually, that's actually the official psychological term for it. Is it like M-E-E-R? -E no, 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 it's not like a meerkat. Or okay, a, or like a no. space station mere. That'd no. be cool if they found out from meerkats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's, it's a thing that like you, they found, they loads of scientific, t like, they did loads of psychological tests, which are scientific tests, and basically being like, Actually, people don't always believe that, but uh, <laughs> um, and they found that yeah, basically, it's like if you're exposed to something repeatedly, you like it more, and people like always feel like it's been some sort of like well, like yeah, I was saying to you the other day, like people always feel like oh yeah, I really didn't like that guy at first, but you know I've, I've taken the shine to him now. They always feel like it's some sort of because as humans, we're really good at convincing ourselves that we're not we're something more than animals or machines that we're intuiting something yeah. a bit deeper. So we'll like, we'll like attribute that change to something else, like. You know, I really didn't like him, but then there was that night, and I kind of realised actually through because of this that actually he's all right. When it's like eh, eh. You've, just, <laughs> you've spent sufficient time in his company, that your brain is to so like him, and that's why when I get people saying, "Oh yeah, do you like?" I remember I can't remember what Radiohead album it was. I think it was the one after In Rainbows that was just to be King of Limbs. King of Limbs. Had people say to me. I didn't like it at first, but after about six or seven listens, it's like, no, no. <laughs> like, if you don't like something until you've been exposed to it six or seven times, it's not probably not good. Or, well, not good, but you, you don't like it. You only like it because 
You've exposed you, yourself to it. So taking that into consideration, my argument as to why Monster Hunter is not that alcoholic friend who hangs around and who, <laughs> like, you know, pisses himself twice a month. Um, the reason why is that I've played it for, God, 150 hours, 200 hours or something. This Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate on the Wii U. And it has given me experiences in return that are like that just are unparalleled in my entire gaming career. Like some, a really specific memory of like playing with Keza, Keza McDonald, now the um, the head of Kotaku UK, also Dark Souls uh, podcast. At some point, at some point, yeah. So but as we I find will. her, and we'll talk about Monster Hunter and share our experiences, and that'd be beautiful. But um, killing a big monster in like the last minute of the timer and both screaming at our consoles, or just the time I fought a bear with a lance. <laughs> and that was actually just magnificent. Like, oh, I remember why it was good. Because I'd never fought with a lance. Why, why wouldn't it be good? Well, it was especially memorable in Monster Hunter terms because this is one of the beautiful things it does. Um, I went into the mission, I've got my big fiery lance, and the lance in Monster Hunter is a hilarious weapon to use. Cause I've used it quite a lot, actually. Yeah, not the gun lance, but the lance. Yeah. I've used both. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, no, the lance is, is so strange because you're it's so heavy and so slow. Yeah. You need to do everything about four seconds before you want it, <laughs> which for dodging is hilarious because, yeah, anyway. Um, but so there's, there's uh, I forget the name of it now, but um, an enormous blue spiny bear, like a big icy porcupine, and uh, I'm fighting it in this. Is that a rabbit? I killed one. No, of them. that's a yeah. That was amazing. With the they're they're great fun. Spinning rabbits. Claw digging their claws into the ice and spinning around. Yeah. No, you would, would have thought the bear. I can't remember its name, but he's got sort of weird shit in his armor, and you find him like feasting on honey. When you oh, yeah, I fought one of them. Right, yeah. so, but it's like that, but a nice one. There's, yeah. there's Monster Hunter R S, right? I forget what it's called. The advanced state where you fight one of them, and but all the monsters are harder in this later variant. Anyway, I'm fighting this thing, and, I'm, and it's running towards me. I'm like, okay, let's do this. I've killed a dozen of you guys. Let's do it. I'm, I'm clocking in, I'm punching into work. And as he gets closer, I realize, fuck, is he, is he bigger than, than all the bam, and he bats me across the battlefield? And the thing is, in Monster Hunter, there is a random chance anytime you go into a mission, that you will fight a king version of that animal. <laughs> and you don't know it. The only way you can tell is if you've played the game enough, the character model is about 115% larger. <laughs> and actually, an interesting thing about the AI of Monster Hunter, as you fight these monsters over and over again, there are slight tweaks in the AI, and sometimes you'll fight uh, Ludroth, the royal Ludroth, that's just a bit fucking meaner than, than other Ludroths, or is a bit smaller or a bit more timid. I find it funny with that, because in the description for the royal Ludroth, which is basically, it's like a Gyarados, really. <laughs> Sort of. <laughs> um, for those of you who played the game Pokemon's, <laughs> um, but it, it's supposed to be really. It says like, oh, it's, it's not as dangerous on land. It's fucking well dangerous on land. <laughs> it just like rolls about and flails. It's like it is like a demented toddler. It's just annoying in water. You have to chase it. Yeah, it's I mean, I mean that's on land. He's a fucker. <laughs> I think I really don't like the underwater stuff. I think that's mainly playing yeah, on pretty bad. Playing on 3ds is just like, ah, oh, don't make me do 3D movement. <laughs> it's fine. It's bad everywhere. Don't worry. It's yeah. just not. The I don't think it's in Monster Hunter the, the Monster Hunter 4. I think they've gotten rid of it. Yeah, because yeah, it's Monster Hunter 4. The new thing is climbing. Oh, uh, so that's like they've got Dragon's Dogma climbing. It's gonna be the best thing. Ooh, and hang on to the backs of pick that old ladies and throw them off cliffs. If if they're in the village, why hey, not? I just want a quick shout out to all of you guys out there who are picking up old ladies and throwing them off cliffs because I've had like about eight <laughs> people in the past week who've been like, I bought Dragon's Dogma based nice. on the chat we had last time. So yeah, throw an old lady off a cliff for us. But not in real life, don't do that in, in real life. Anyway, you were going to talk about it last time, you couldn't, but um, can you now tell us about Mario Kart? Yes, tell us about Mario Kart. It's bloody brilliant. Um, I'm not a huge... I've heard that, I'm not, I've heard this for so long, yeah. but no one's been able to publicly say it because of embargo. Yeah, but now, preview mode uh, is over. Okay. Well... Preview. This is now we are in preview uh, preview window, so I can talk about what's in it and why it's why it's called by coming judgment. So okay. it's, uh, what I've played is so bloody just... brilliant. <laughs> and then it is out. Um, so I've played sixteen tracks, uh, eight of the new ones, eight of the retro ones. The the cool thing with it, I'm I'm not like a huge Mario Kart guy. I never have been. I've been like, oh, it's a fun thing to play. This is the first time where I've been like. Oh my god, I want to know every line Why? in this game. Why? Because uh, every racing it, line. Yeah, I wanna I, I wanna like get in I wanna just be better. I the script or something. Oh yeah, no, I wanna know everything Mario says to Peach behind <laughs> in the pit stops. Um no, it's got this the coolest thing about it is the anti-gravity feature when you first when you first play it, you're like, I don't really get it. Like, I flip upside down, but the camera's fixed, so it all makes almost no difference. Like, it's, it's nice, like, the scenery looks cool, and it's like, it's an amazing looking game. Like, 
so you astounding. So the camera actually rotates 180 degrees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you 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 move with it unless you're on a wall, at which point it kind and of you comes float upside down. down. Yeah. So presumably you can avoid what's on the ground. Uh, well, if there's two routes, yes, but a lot of the time just the track is upside down, just because it looks cool, and you're like, well, okay, I kind I, I see, but it's it's not much. But then when you start playing with specifically in four player. Um, it changes, for the first time ever, it changes how everyone races um, because when you're in anti-gravity, running into someone gives you a boost. So the point being, as soon as it's in anti-grav anti -grav mode, you want to be in a pack. Usually you'd be like, I'm staying the fuck away from Bowser because he's bigger than everyone else, he's going to knock me and, you know, his weight trumps my weight. for six. Exactly, I fall right off the edge and Lakitu's slow. Oh. This time Lakitu's fast for a start, which is good. Um, but also, <laughs> um, but but now you see, like, four people going on what appears to be the, sh the slower route and you're like, well, I'm going to go to them because I can knock into all four of them and get four boosts and be ahead of everyone else. But wouldn't, why wouldn't they get the boost as well? Well, it, I think they do. But the point is, as soon as everyone starts doing it, it's like, who can knock into the most people whilst they don't knock so into let me just get everyone this else? So basically, when you're in anti-gravity mode, is it, because I've got this vision in my mind of, um, uh, have you guys played Gunstar Heroes? Yeah. You know that level in the mines when you can basically like where you jump flip between the you can and flip the floor. between the ceiling and the floor. Or tap the button repeatedly. But if you yeah, but if you keep tapping it, then it means you like you end up just floating in the middle without actually landing on either side. Is it like that of being like a swap? But you can no you cancel don't, the swap. You don't or? choose like most of the time. You're you're forced to be in anti gravity mode for a section of the track just for what appears to be spectacle. Um, so, for instance, there's a really cool track called Shy Guy Falls where you go up one yeah, I've heard this. up one waterfall with boost pads falling down it, which is, just looks amazing and all the water flying on the camera and stuff. And then you go up around a track and then go down a parallel waterfall and like flow, fly over a valley. And it's like that was a really like spectacular, it was moment. a beautiful moment. It's a wonderful <laughs> moment. I'll remember it to the <laughs> end of my days. Uh, but in the, at the same time, as soon as you understand that you kind of want, if you're ahead. At that point, you'll want to speed ahead of other people because they'll be trying to run into sure. you. If you're behind, you suddenly go, there are three people on that waterfall. If I can catch all of them and they only catch me, then I get th you know two more boosts than any of them and just fly so up around So it's about it. seeing people coming, whether they're behind you or in front of you, and being able to bounce into There's them. A, so it's a, it's a way more visual and sort of reactive game than it ever has right, been before. Because fundamentally racing is really antisocial because exactly. you're trying to put as much distance... You are literally putting as much distance between yourself and your friends as you can. Exactly. Whereas this is encouraging you and your friends to essentially do bumper cars. Yeah, it's great. And it, yeah, exactly. It's got that dodgems feat, but like, you know... Dodgems with an advantage to smashing into each other without getting whiplash. Like it's, uh, and it's got this. It's, it's just got this sort of. I think I'm stealing this from uh, Matthew Castle, but essentially what he said is it's the first time it feels like um, the race is out of the control of the track itself. It's the feeling that suddenly everyone racing has a stake in how that race is going to play out, as opposed to them just knowing the best way around. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a lot of people. There's always two. Like science to Mario Kart, some people being like, "Oh, Mario Kart, who gives a shit?" And other people being like, "Mario Kart, you can't say Mario Kart's bad." But I'm sort of in the middle of being like, I've had some of the best like experiences mm. uh, playing Mario Kart, but recently, I mean, uh, the Wii um, game, the Wii Mario Kart, I didn't get on with at all mm. um, for a whole bunch of reasons. But that I used to love like the Game Boy Advance one and the DS one, like so good. I used to play them on my own and like just get so into them. Well, this is there's surely like so sharp. how much you get into Mario Kart is to do with how often you're in a room with people and multiple. No, 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 but, no but this is the thing is that what I'm talking about. Is yeah, no, which is why you can enjoy them single player as a huge thing. Yeah, right? and that's the thing. I think people often just write off them as being like, hey, it's multiplayer fun for all the family. And actually, it's like no, when they're done right, they're fucking great well, that's games. Same as anything Nintendo do, I guess. Like. I didn't tell you anything right. It, it transcends being family fun and it's like a really good Pixar film. It's just really good. Yeah, yeah. But I, I yeah, I'm interested by this. Like, I'm, I'm not able to talk much about the single player beyond what I've done in that and multiplayer. It feels really nice. It looks like does genuinely it, astounding. Does it still it have the ridiculous Mario power up, the super, uh, Mario Kart power ups of. Oh, I'm in last place. I've now spammed an attack at every. Yeah, the so there is, there is still the you know the which isn't you can necessarily get a bad thing. Stuff. We're yeah. both rolling our eyes, but actually, I don't know how I'd feel if they removed that. Exactly, well, like, hmm. but they do some weird stuff. So, for instance, the blue shell is now not 
Oh yes, I remember the, the bullshit shell. Yeah, yeah the so one the, that they added in the, the Wii version. Yeah, it was like an exploding blue shell. So that fuck you. That is, <laughs> that is still there, but it's now more of a boon in as much as the person at the back is, you know, the person who most often or only gets it. I'm not sure how how it plays out in yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's now everybody, right? No, so it only hit the person in first. So it was just a complete fuck you to the person who'd been doing best. You know, like, legitimately it was just, that person's doing best, screw them. Well, I remember with the, with the Wii version, the reason I hated it is it became actually more sensible to try and hang back in second. Yeah, the whole game. Just tailgate the guy. And then, oh, now right now this is my turn to win. Yeah, just the, so really you're Which fucking is, around until the last 60 seconds of the race. It's just no fun for anyone, man. No. Like, you know. And it's not, it's not quite fixed, but what they've, what how they've, changed it for this one is the person at the back gets it and it shoots out and it doesn't fly over everyone else it sort of skips down the track and so it can hit theoretically it can hit every other racer on the track so now it's kind of skewed to going if you're at the back here's the best thing you can have to get back into the game because it will knock people yeah, yeah it will still all i think always hit the person in first which is a problem but well i'm not I, I mean, but if it hits everyone else it's just it brings that whole sort of thing concertina back into there's a pack in the middle and then you get an anti yeah. section it's all great again <laughs> so, right i think the problem is it's like it it felt very much just vindictive yeah it didn't feel like a solution it felt just like well i'm losing so fuck you it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a solution in the sense that you know like setting the game on fire would be a tell you what this is why <laughs> micro machines is the best well, it's the worst, best I racing know what you mean, game. Because it never looked Because good. every time the racing game would break, it goes, oh, I'll just stop there, thanks. I'll just <laughs> move everything back. And go again! Oh, it literally, it was like, yeah, as soon as anyone got foot out of shot. I mean, actually, that was a really smart system, in a way. I mean, it was, it was You've got so far ahead that now it doesn't feel like it's fun. You've won a point. Carry on. Yeah, Mario Kart, I guess, was kind of hampered by the camera. Mario Kart, I guess, is the way they did system, it. System, though. I mean, it, Mario Kart, nothing stops Mario Kart if someone gets in the first place enough, they get a point. Well, the thing is, and I, oh, every time I, I say this and, and shout about this, and I do say this and shout about it, usually every time it goes on sale, and I get a response usually of either people going, yes, yes, you're fucking too right, or looking at me as if I'm some bloke on the street with a sign saying, end, the end is not here. But um, Sonic. Um, Sonic Racing. Wow. <laughs> I thought you were no. going to go for like Blur or something. No, well, it's, it's made, made, by, by, the, it's made by the Blur guys, but. Bizarre. Some of them, yeah, not bizarre. Well, some of them, made yeah. by some of them at Sumo. It's not a perfect game. It's right? rubbish. It's not <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> you played it properly. Oh, yeah, yeah, I reviewed it. I was the only person. Uh, I, I have a. Uh, is this massively. Uh, it's probably massively unprofessional. Not going to tell that story. <laughs> <Okay>. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, but I, I really liked it. I mean, it's like obviously I knew there was a, there's lots of things bad that are a bit crap. And it's actually. It's one of those weird games that falls into the slot of like Viva Pinata of being like clearly aimed at kids and yet actually like not a kid's game because it's a lot more complicated and, and tricky than it looks. And it's like I, I first thought, oh, this is alright. What was it on? It's on everything. everything yeah. um, it was out now. It was out, uh, what was it, like? Probably about a year and a half, two years ago. Yeah. Right? It was just after I started at O&M, you were doing yeah. it, I was reviewing it, yeah. Um, but uh, I kind of... Oh, it was like Romeo and Juliet. It was wonderful. I can't remember what I didn't... Did I review it? I don't remember reviewing it. But you <laughs> certainly played it. I reviewed a ton of stuff, I can't remember half mm. the shit. But, uh, but it's just the fact that it ends up being this... Yeah, and it's, it reminds me of what we're talking about, of having that, that kind of more dynamic element of different things you can do in the track that mm. make it... I love the way that you'd be able to just constantly doing things like drifting, but then also like uh, doing stunts in the air and building up. And it became this thing of being like, you realised after a while, if you got really good at it, you would be constantly boosting through a variety of things that you could do. And it was just, I don't know, it was like it was quite an ugly game. I didn't like the art direction that much. And I thought that it could have been a lot better. But in that kind of zone of being like, well, there's no Mario Kart on the horizon for a long time. And actually, it's always on sale on Steam for like £3. Oh, it's, it's like a tenner on Wii U now. Like, and nothing goes on sale on Wii U because they don't sell anything. But I, uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, you did get on with it, but I thought it was really good. And it took me a few hours to click with it. It took me a few hours to go from being like, this is all right, I suppose. And then suddenly, I think the moment where it clicked for me was the fact that I realised that the stunts you can do, it gives you a variety of different stunts you can do, and if you land that stunt cleanly, you get a boost. But it kind of felt like that bollocks video game thing of being like, 
all the stunts are the same. It doesn't really matter. Like, do you want to do a roll? Do you want to do a spin? Oh, so you can do different stunts for different kinds of boosts? No, but then when I realize... you land them and stuff, right? Yeah. So it's like the, the time it takes to do it. Yeah, like on certain types of like jumps, you, a backflip would make more sense because because it would give you slightly more air or something. And But then it would be slower and I don't know. But the thing that made me realize it was genius was the fact that I realized in some courses, I was like, there were separate boosts like, on the ground that you could hit, but it was like, impossible to take the jump at that angle and I was like how do you get there and then I realized that when you were doing the barrel rolls you it physically faster. moved you about like half an inch of, like it physically moved you a couple of feet like that direction so what you do is you jump into the air and then you barrel roll barrel roll barrel roll and then you physically end up like fur way further to the right than than you would have done originally and then it yeah it was one of those kind of really so it's a kind of mini game into being airborne. Yeah, I mean, I really liked it because of the fact that the, the kind of the thing that was bollocks about it was what they've done is they basically taken all of the power ups from Blur and then just sort of put a faintly cutesy point to say what awful they were shy. So, so the ideas bad. of the power ups were fine. Mm, some were like I, I don't know. I mean, it's been a while it's... since I played it, so I can't point to any. It just felt it felt like the power ups were this felt like they put them on top of quite a good... It felt like they lost confidence in a racing game that they'd made, basically, and mm. went, mm, can't game, better do it. I know, and, like, <laughs> Blur never made you feel like the power-ups were the thing. It made no, you feel yeah. like you're skillful, and this one made you feel like, use these, though, because it's car game, and we're on, you know... It's Mario but Kart even so, around. like, I mean, I know what you mean. I think they had to do that because they were making a car racer, mm. right? But, I mean, even then, it's the fact that they basically copied so much of the stuff from Blur with Power Ups, which I thought was smart. Like, the way that now, I think it was Bees was the ultimate thing you could get. Yeah. Bees! <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's exactly the same as the Pillars of Light from Blur, which were admittedly a lot cooler. They were being like, you'd send off these bees or wasps, more likely wasps, isn't it, to be honest. Um, and then they'd create this thing in front of the person in first that was really uh, difficult mm. to evade. So, I mean, if they were really good, they'd be able to evade it. But at the very least, they would have to slow down. Like, I mean, you Which know, is actually better than the blue shell thing. Absolutely, that's the thing. Is It was better in blow and the lightning was better. The thing about the blue shell thing is, this is honestly not something I know, but it is a rumour um, that there, there's there been a couple of items shown that you can't use in the preview build we've played uh, from trailers and stuff. There is what could be perceived to be a blue shell reflector <laughs> which, which is really interesting in as much, or not a reflector, like a shield of some kind. Uh, it appears to be some sort of like big horn that I, I guess would like blow stuff back. So the idea being, if you're confident, you're, this is all conjecture, but if you're confident <laughs> that you're going to be in first, you just hold this item for the entire race. You don't give yourself any of the power-ups that everyone else on the, smart. On, smart. on the track is getting. I hope that's in it because that's that's a really cool like you know fun risk reward thing that Mario Kart just doesn't do usually. You know everyone talks oh, everyone no. everyone talks about Blur and how it's like a tragedy that you know that that's the game that didn't sell. But Project Gotham is is my favourite of Bizarre's racing games and that solution for person in first normally not caring. Of course the the kudos system where you if you touch the side of the. Of, of, of the course, that's that's the worst thing in the world. You've scratched your car. <laughs> Fuck! And you lose you, your whole combo is lost and all that stuff. So even if you're in first, it doesn't mean you're any more likely to be caught up than everyone else. So what it does mean is you never stop being scared. Like you can be you can be lapping people and shitting yourself because if you hit their car, then you get scratched. And because what's the point of winning? I don't. I mean, Blow was massively uh, like I actually I was working on the PR side of things when uh, when Blow was actually actually working on Blur. The two games uh, that was the point at which I realised I didn't want to work in PR anymore. Was uh, I, I got to choose which two games I wanted to work on because I was the person who really cared about games, and I chose uh, Blur and Singularity, and uh, two games which I thought were, were great games that died on their ass. Um, and I kind of thought I don't want to watch this happen again. <laughs> um, but anyway, um. I think it was the difficult thing about Blur was the fact that they didn't know how to communicate it. They were, they were like, it looked like a kind of traditional racing game with all the real cars, and but then it's like, it actually played like Mario Kart, mm. but they they kind of they couldn't work out who to market it at, and it was a very strange prospect. It was, but the thing was, the thing that saddest about that is actually I didn't even realise, despite working on the game and knowing it really well, what the best thing about that game was. It was my brother who discovered it because I gave him. Like, I had a promo copy that I had and I didn't want because I played it at the moment, so I gave it to him. And um, 
he was like, this game is amazing if you go to the option settings and put rubber banding on full and put power-ups on random and then play full play split screen. And it was a thing of being like, yeah, like, it was all about that online matchmaking, online multiplayer. Mm. And actually, but if you played it like Mario Kart and went through and tweaked the settings What's to make rubber it... Banding? Rubber banding basically means it's like easier to catch up. Oh, okay, so... Right. So it means that if you're in first, like, you know, you can... You know, it keeps the pack t- together. Mm. But apparently it was just an amazing party. And I played it a bit in that moment. He was right. It was just like... This is badass. But I wonder how many people even did that because I played a bit online and it was fun. But yeah, it's a shame. It was a, it was a weird game. It was weird it got that far. I'm kind of gutted that they were clearly working on Blur 2 when they got the studio killed and that could have been awesome. Anyway, let's um, jump to some questions. Uh, I'm going to skip that one because we could talk about that for way too long. Um, um, this is an easy one. It should be. What's your favourite game that you've picked up? Without knowing anything about it before buying it, I guess that's something we used to do when we were kids. A that's been a long time. Yeah, my, my whole when I had a, a, a PS2 that may or may not have been entirely legal. <laughs> my favourite thing in the world was to download torrents of Japanese games with my super limited knowledge of Japanese. The PS2 was great for that. PS2 and PSX. Just the Sony lowered the cost. The install base was so high, and Sony lowered the cost of making games so much that people could just print a DVD and put their bullshit game on it. And you download it if you've got a PS2, which isn't illegal. Which isn't legal. And you have no idea what you're getting. And I played glorious shit. Ori no Ruori is my answer to this, which is, which translates as uh, my man cooking. And all it was was a competitive cooking game where every time you got combos of food and sent it off, so you've chopped the vegetables and you've stewed it and you send it off in a big stew, if you send off three of them at the same time, something horrible happens in your opponent's restaurant, like they get mugged and nothing you have to wiggle the analog sticks to chase the robber down the streets. But the game the game was amazing and it was it was so depressing to me seeing Cooking Mama and um, I love Cooks of Delicious, but even that game can't hold the torch to Ori Nova Rory, which well, never got a Western release. Even with a similar thing, I remember uh, when I used to live with uh, Sean Bell from Midnight Resistance now, like, and he had uh, Raw Danger. Oh. And it was like, <laughs> he, he'd acquired that in a similar fashion at the time. Um, and just watching them play that, it was just like, this game's fucking mental. And actually quite good as well. Yeah, the, like, these, there were so many games that never got a Western release that were wacky, but, but also very good, actually, so yeah. polished and well made. It was a golden age for people who like weird bullshit like me. Yeah, there's <laughs> things I miss that weird bullshit now. That was the same. Everybody talks about um, Earth Defense Force and how, oh, it's wacky. Earth Defense Force was part of a series. Um, yeah, actually, Global, Global Defense Force on Glo- the PlayStation was better because you had jetpacks and lasers. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the first Earth Defense Force, I think, on PS2's first mission, because if you don't know anything about it, it's even funnier because you start off on, um, uh, on, West, on a bridge in London looking at Big Ben. Yeah. And you have no idea what's about to happen. And then <laughs> huge ants crawl out at you from every direction and you have to start killing them. That's weird. Yeah. I kind of, people still embrace that series, but I think they're just, I don't know, I haven't played a recent one, but it felt like the last one they played just felt like way too trying to be quirky whilst just being a shit Western yeah, game. Yeah, it was, it's not. And, but that is the one example of total B-movie PS2 wackiness that actually made it survive over to the West. I still keep it actually, it's funny, I'm, I'm, as um, those of you who watch my update videos will know, I'm in the process of moving house and I've actually like, I've just recycled all of my gem cases for like every Xbox 360 game I own, I've thrown away a lot of plastic boxes and put them on the CD wallet, but I haven't with my PS2 games. Well they feel like artifacts, right? Yeah they do, mm. but also it's the fact that they're like, I've, the PS2 games I've got are quite a small collection and some of them are a bit shit, but a lot of them are like, I've got like stuff like Gregory Horror Show that are just like, these really weird games that I love. And I don't I have an attachment to them that I never really quite formed with anything modern. But um, I think my game that I bought without knowing anything about it was um, Fallout 2, which I bought purely because the box had a cool picture of a... That's what I did with my one, yeah. which was a PSX game called Warzone 2100. Oh, actually, okay, yeah, yeah, that's an RTS, right? Yeah, and you, like, made all the tanks. You could, like, build yeah. the tanks out of lots of pieces, and it just, like, blew my mind, because I bought it because it just had a, like angry red cover and I was like, like oh, I'm you control man. the units? Or yeah, like, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I think it was like Red Alert that you controlled your own dudes. Yeah. I, I mean, no, like, not controlled your own dudes, you built your own and designed your own dudes. There was another one, I think, where you could actually go in first person so you could build a, you could build a tank and then control the tank. And like, I feel like around. that may have been a feature in it. Like, it's one of, that's the thing, is like, I remember loving it so much that I went in and told everyone at school, like, yeah, fucking, like, the tanks you build, I put it on top, it was amazing. And then no one bought it and it just died. Because I had no one to talk about it with, so I was just like, oh, I don't know. And that, so I remember it as like this kind of 
haze of wonder and then it's just gone like but yeah pure cover art yeah, just reminded me i think my, the first time i realized the first time i was like savvy enough to realize that i was making a social faux pas uh was me walking to school with a friend of mine i can't remember who it was walking to school i must have been year eight year nine and talking about how cool red alert was all the way to the point, <laughs> to the point that i realized like towards the end i was like oh um you don't want to hear this. I'm boring you. And that was the first time I'd ever really had that conscious thought of being like, the person I'm talking to is not saying anything. I'm a they dog. don't want to hear me talk about how fucking awesome it is when the dogs rip people's throats out when and then you blow up the barrels and everything's frozen. This is getting frozen. But um, yeah, it's, it's no surprise I ended up doing what I'm doing. I was, I was looking for the link to, the, to make that joke, but uh, but no, you got there. Yeah, you, you sort of neutralised that bomb before. Uh... I, it's not a surprise. It's sort of like my parents always said I grew up at games, and I, I don't think I ever will. Oh god, can I just say thank you to the Daft Souls reader who um, a couple of podcasts ago I mentioned how there's no bomb disarming games, and uh, and that sent me on, on an exploration thing with his help that led to me looking at an amazing game jam game of people wearing an Oculus Rift and trying to disarm a bomb. While their friends all have the bomb manuals in front of them, <laughs> so you're on the Oculus Rift going, okay, it's got it's got wires, and the, the YouTube video is so fucking funny because they're all going, give us the serial number, dude, come on, because you've got a timer and everything blows up in two minutes, and they'll say, okay, I've got the serial number, here's the serial number, here's a keypad, and they go, press a one, they're done, press the zero, there's no zero, and they're looking through the manuals going, what, there has to be a zero, what are you disarming? It was. Beautiful. That's I amazing. love that. That Oculus Rift thing of um, this sort of influx of uh, essentially games that are nightmare. You know, the, yeah. like one person who can't Funny see how what everyone the else The stuff that excites us most about Oculus Rift is all to do with one person wearing it. Yeah, and exactly. the rest of you just doing other shit around like, it. Have either of you played um, Tomb, which is like a sort of super quick game put together by Spilt Milk Studios? Which is no. the first game I ever played on Oculus Rift. And it's essentially. Uh, oh, yeah, one person has a map, right? One, well, two people have a map, each with one monster on them, and one person's in the, the, in the tomb trying to escape both monsters for as long as possible. But they've got two people shouting where their monsters are, and so they're like, turn right, and the other person's like, I'm fucking. <laughs> it's a minotaur! <laughs> you know, like, it's great. Like, it's, it's just like this That's terrifying amazing, experience, yeah. and, and being in it, just in this super, you know. Nothing to it's it. It's kind of I find it bizarre that it's that it's not being made by Nintendo because it just it just feels like that, that that like when it comes out it feels like the main thing that's going to make it really work is that it's, you're not going to be able to afford like four people so you can all go on a boat adventure with a family of all looking at monkeys. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's going to be that whole thing if you've got one. So we need to work out how we can make it fun. Yeah. For mm. Although you to do stuff know, with one. The problem is that Nintendo have not taken a financial risk for quite some time and that's their strategy and that's okay but it sure as hell means they're not going to be spending money on a 400 no, they're pounds not, they're not going to be doing that that's fair enough though um, James E. Marshall asks Marty O'Donnell Bungie he says beginning 10 speculation now you know what I, I've watched this unfold today obviously Marty O'Donnell has been with Bungie for like a long time and he's basically been like fired today it seems like it seemed like Bungie have said it's been great working with him, but it's sad that our time has ended, but it's ending. But he sort of said he was let go without any... Well, we should... A lot of the time when this kind of thing happens, a day later the person comes back and says, Oh, no, I'm sorry, I was I confused everyone. I didn't mean to express that I was fired. I don't... Yeah, I mean, that may be, but I mean, he clearly was. I mean, you wouldn't... The way he put it was like, <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, like he was let go. But the thing is, everyone's kicked off and they've gone, Fuck Bungie! Fuck Bungie! How could you do this? But it's like, I, I find bizarre that, like, A, he's a composer, right? Mm. He's been, like, fully employed for, like, by one company for years. Oh, when does that happen? Like, David I, Wise is freelance. And yeah. He's done everything. Like, like fucking, like, that's not how compo... Com that's not how it works. <laughs> like, usually, like, they go, do you want to be the composer of this game? They do the job, they do it. It's like, what's he doing in between? Is he doing, like... Concept composing? <laughs> hey guys, I just made the tune. What are we going to do? It? Don't know, just like, just Imagine do if it. it came out that it's like Hans Zimmer had been personally employed by Christopher Nolan for years. He was just yeah. like, yeah, and I've been let go by, yeah. by the Nolan <laughs> brothers. I can't believe the Nolan brothers have fired me. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's odd, but at the same time, it's like, it's just, I find it very silly that everyone's just immediately gone, oh, um, like, oh, I can't believe. Can't believe they fired him. Like, People don't get fired for no it reason. It sounds to like, me like gamers being angry because gamers, you know, the, the guy's a good composer, but we've got an awful lot of those working in the industry. Well, it's, it's not even that. It's the fact that you kind of like, you know, the guy's a, he's a great composer. He's a really funny 
guy. Oh, I wasn't aware he had a cult personality type of thing. Right? Yeah, no, he's really. I mean, I've seen him. I've seen him speaking when I was at Halo Fest, which was the most confusing. Halo Fest. <laughs> yeah, I went to Halo Fest. I How many there. Halo Fests were there? Uh, there was one. Interesting. <laughs> uh, and I've been to it. I was there. I was there. You were there, man. You don't understand. Daddy, where were you when Halo Fest? Got that's, like, out. that's like being at the first Glastonbury if Glastonbury never happened again. <laughs> it was me. No, there was this dude with a weird chin strap beard. It was kind of crazy. And we it left. was basically, I mean, like, it's obvious what happened now, but it was in the run up to Halo 4, and it was basically uh, Microsoft hired out a place like connects to PAX and it was sort of very sort of conjoined they had an area and it was Halo Fest as part of PAX East and it was basically them just being like we you don't you really don't like the fact that Bungie aren't making this game so they really wanted to have a show of faith of um of being like you know it's going to be all right Halo 4 will be an okay game so they did this as Halo Fest so you can all the fans they got all the hardest but biggest fans to come down into this one place and I, because I was sent by OXM to cover it, and it was me and Martin Gaston, um, and l it was insane. I mean, we, we literally, we didn't, we didn't fuck around because we didn't have a PR out with us, so we had the opportunity to just fuck around. We didn't. We were there. Which I sat through about 30 hours worth of seminars, and wow, within three or four days, we spent so much time listening to people talking about, talking about Halo. It was ridiculous. See, when you say Halo Fest, I expect, like, you know, Fiesta. Not, <laughs> not seminars about like panels and, and like it was was there a dance Halo party? No, I mean there, there, there was a little party on the night when they because they announced that there were going to be like you could get the Warthog from Halo uh, was going to be in Forza Motorsport Four I think at the time it was this was a long time ago so they had announcements on the ship but it was just hilarious because it was this thing of like having people from Bungie and having people from Three One One on the panels and it was just hilarious like I can't remember the guy I think it was Dan Ayud. Dan Oud from, uh, from, from either Microsoft or whatever is hilarious. He was just this incredible robot. I watched him give the same, <laughs> uh, I watched him give the same presentation for Halo um, Collector's Edition, or the Anniversary Edition. Mm. I watched him give the same demo of that three times in three days because we were just, he, he, it would be like you go to a panel, it's like, hey, before we do this panel, I just want to show you guys something cool. It's a world exclusive. And you're like, Oh, you're gonna do it again? <laughs> and he he hit like he he went through the game and he made the same jokes, same like cadence, same beats, same cadence yeah. of voice. It was insane. It's like you're incredible, but also a robot in the fact that you are. You you've done this hundreds of times, and yet every time you do it, you give the impression of it all being off the cuff jokes. Mm. He's quite good at it, but it was like, oh my god, what's wrong with you, dude? That you can do that that well. And there was a hilarious thing with the panel afterwards. Of whenever anyone asked a question, it was. Whenever he was on a panel, it'd be the thing of people going, everyone would look at each other and go, I don't know, maybe that's one for Dan. <laughs> because there's this thing of like, you could tell he had this like really ominous, like, you're not allowed to say these things. So <laughs> as soon as he wasn't on panels, they were all just like having fun chatting, you know, not saying anything bad, but being like, you know, oh, but whenever he was there, it was like, um, Dan, maybe, maybe you should answer that. <laughs> It was fascinating to be there, but um, you know, sadly there hasn't been another Halo Fest since, and uh, I'd love to go again and expand what I know about the Halo universe. Halo Fest 2015, roll on. But uh, yeah, well, I thought it'd be fun. I mean, you know, the thing is, it, people, hero worship within the gaming industry, we, we've always seen this with like people being like uh, attributing the entire work of studios to one person. Yeah. You forget that often, like yeah, their studios and their things make great work. They're really charismatic on camera. But I've met people who who make great work and are really charismatic on camera and behind closed doors they're fucking assholes. <laughs> so God knows what Martin McDonald is probably put his knob in the yogurt, I think. <laughs> and on that note um, as we go for the final question, let's go for this one. Well this is a two parter. This two -parter. Two, one tweet couldn't handle this question. This is by Purple Chair aka Man Puncher. Man well, Puncher. I'll get you into the uh, the mood. You are on the toilet with your handheld game console of choice. It's never a good way to begin a sentence. What's your handheld game uh, console of choice? 3DS, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the champion's console. <laughs> mine might be the iPad now. I think mine Ooh. might be, if I'm going to talk all time, it's either going to be a GBA Micro or a DS Lite. But anyway. Uh, alternative. Oh, right. I didn't realise we could go back. Mine's of course you can. You can do what you want. 
Game Gear. <laughs> Don't be a dick. <laughs> a Game Gear, your toilet is very close to a power outlet. Well, I'm unsafe in the toilet. <laughs> I've got three extension leads. <laughs> your pockets, your pockets. It's that image of a toaster in the bath, right? It's yeah. a Game Gear hovering perilously above the toilet water. <laughs> Your pockets are brimming with double A batteries. <laughs> <laughs> to the north, <laughs> to your north is a ladder. Yeah. Um, suddenly, so this is, we're all on toilet with consoles. Suddenly, the chilling realization that you have no toilet paper. Which game, or games in brackets, do you clean yourself with? Oh Z? shit! I'm fucked because I chose uh, the iPad. <laughs> oh, I was, see, that's buttons. the thing. If it's if it's 3DS, like. I only download games on that thing. Like, I just have to, I'm going to get out the top screen because it's got that sort of, like, I've got a smaller one. It's got, like, a, a ridge around the edge, so I think that would scrape quite well. Oh, <laughs> it, would really, it would really Christ. do the job. Well, quite. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and take it away from that by, by reminding myself of the fact that when I've got, I've got 3DS, let's just say I've got my 3DS, and I was given, at the time, I thought it was an act of kindness, um, but somebody, uh, when I worked in Future, gifted me here you are, I have this, a copy of Ridge Racer on the 3DS, which was on the launch titles. And I was like, are you sure? Are you sure? Really? I can have this? Thank you so much. He's <laughs> a fucking shit. So I worked my ass with that quite happily. Oh, and M Silver Award, so... <laughs> before, my, before my time. Before your time, yeah, absolutely. I think I reviewed some stuff around here before your time. Anyway, what, what are you going to do with your iPad? Uh, Say you could virtually print out a game that you would wipe yourself Well, I'll tell you what, we've mentioned, um, what, what's it called? Endless Space? I forget that. Oh, Out There. Out There. Don't you worry. put yourself in Out There. Oh, well, out There is a game that has willingly brutalised me, mm. so it would be my opportunity to get my own back That's on the fair. concept of space, and how often does that fucking happen? Thank you for giving me the ability to print out the concept, and now... Well, we'll go with it. I see can... what I've achieved. <laughs> Quentin wiping his ass with the infinity... Of space, the yawning void. I would, in more ways than one. If we're honest, that would probably sort of suck me in in a black hole type situation on contact. Well, yeah. we ended last week's uh, podcast with people talking about um, sucking things off, so now we're going to end it with sucking things in. That's been Dark Souls podcast number five. Been five. That's more than a month. And I've been joined by Quinta Smith. Hello. No, I got caught off guard. <laughs> yeah, I've done that more times than I'd like to admit as well. This won't be a ghost cast. We don't need to do it again. <laughs> and Joe Scrubbles. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.